rough path. I don't like laser pointers. They drive me nuts. Remember Claire's? Claire's uh, <laughs> okay, so this is all stuff that you guys know. Um, and that's that it's, you know, send as a member of the Pyramid Severity family. Um, it's an envelope, negative sense, single stranded RNA virus. So, what does negative sense mean? This is not a test. This everybody knows this because this is kind of critical. Right, it means that the, the RNA genome of the virus is complementary to messenger RNA. And what that means for the virus is that the virus has to bring in with it the enzymes that are capable of um, replicating the RNA genome and making messenger RNAs from it. Because we do not carry enzymes that can take an RNA and make a template or, or, or make a complementary sequence of RNA from that. So we have to bring those, the virus has to bring those proteins in and the gene that encodes them. If you have a positive sense RNA virus, if you just got the RNA into the host cell, that RNA would be infectious and it could start replicating. So for positive sense RNA viruses, they really only need to bring in the genes that encode those proteins that are involved in replicating the genome and making messenger RNAs. But for the negative sense RNA viruses, they have to bring in not only the gene, but they have to bring in copies of the proteins. Because the first thing that has to happen is that negative sense has to serve as a template for either making messenger RNAs or making a full-length positive sense RNA during the process of replication. Okay? So it's important to understand that. Okay, so um, this is an envelope virus, which means that um, in addition, viruses, all viruses in general have some sort of nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA, and then they have a protein outer coat, which is called a capsid. Okay, that's the simplest RNA, simplest viruses, but um, some viruses in addition to that have an outer membrane that surrounds the capsid, and that's what this virus does. And so that membrane is actually picked up from the plasma membrane of the host cell as the virus exits the host cell. And so what that, what that does for the virus is it, it, um, it provides another um, mechanism for protecting the sensitive nucleic acid of, <coughs> of the virus. And for viruses that don't have an envelope, um, the capsid itself has to protect it, so the nucleic acid has to be totally inside. But when you've got an envelope virus, actually the, the RNA is complexed with capsid material, so it's not, the, the capsid is, doesn't have the function of having to protect the RNA because it's got that outer protection from the envelope. Okay? The envelope also provides the virus with a means of exiting the host cell without necessarily killing it. So I think Sendai most often does kill, but if you um, think about retroviruses that sit in the genome of um, the host and produce low levels of virus, they can do that and not kill the host cell because the virus buds out of the host cell, takes a piece of the plasma membrane, and then the plasma membrane reseals itself. Okay, so this provides an advantage to the virus. In addition to not having to use the capsid to protect the nucleic acid, it allows the virus to actually um, be able to exit the host cell without necessarily killing it. Okay. So um, we've been working with wild type Zenda virus, and everybody in this lab knows that it causes a respiratory tract infection in rodents. Um, and we use mice, but it's, it's basically all rodents. And um, many years ago, actually before I came to Cal State LA, shortly before I came to Cal State LA, a variant of Senda virus was isolated by um, folks that I collaborated with when I first came here, including Joe Sato. Um, so that vi variant was called F1R. And that virus differed from the wild type virus in that instead of causing a localized respiratory tract infection, it actually caused a systemic infection. So that's an infection throughout the entire body. Okay. So the goal of my lab has always been to determine at the molecular level what are the changes between the wild type virus and F1R 
that allow F1R to have evolved into a virus that could cause a systemic infection. Right? And obviously, you guys all know this, um, by understanding all of these mechanisms, you have the potential for the development of some sort of therapeutic interaction for viruses that are similar to this virus, but infect humans. Okay? So examples of this are influenza virus, which is very similar. The main difference between influenza and Sendai is that it has a segmented genome. But in, a, in every other sense, it's very similar to influenza, or to, to um, Sendai. And then respiratory syncytial virus is a major pathogen of children, and that's um, found in the same terms of their they group. <clears throat> So this is just to illustrate what I said before. I'm not going to go through all this, just that the, this, the negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses um, are, are class 5, and that RNA is actually complementary to messenger RNA. So it's used as a template to make messenger RNAs. Okay? And viruses are classified based on how the genomic material is related to messenger RNA. That's all I'm going to say about that. So um, we've already said this before. So all RNA viruses have to bring in their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Those are the enzymes that take a template of RNA and make a complementary sequence of RNA. Because okay, we don't have those enzymes, bacteria don't have those enzymes. It's kind of something that's pretty unique to viruses. Um, they're also called replicases. So when you're reading articles, you might see the term replicase rather than RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, and one of the unique things about these is that they're really error-prone. They make many more mistakes than our um, polymerases do. And not only are they more error-prone, <coughs> they have no proofreading. So when they make a mistake, it doesn't get corrected. So these viruses are rapidly, rapidly evolving. And so if you look at the majority of the newly emerging infectious diseases, by far the majority of them are RNA viruses. And I'm sure that this is because they evolve so rapidly, because they have such an error-prone polymerase, because that polymerase has no proofreading function. Okay? Um, so, even in a, a single infection within an animal, often you have what are called a lot of quasi-species. They're not, it's not a different species of Sendai virus, but it may have a few mutations. So it's kind of a pain in the butt to work with because it does change a lot because it's so, the RNA polymerase is so error prone. Um, to contribute even more to um, changes that occur in the genome of the virus, one of the innate defenses against infections is nitric oxide production. And that actually helps to potentiate um, or accelerate mutations in the virus. So there's a whole lot of things coming together that make these viruses be able to rapidly, rapidly evolve. And I think they just came up with some new SARS-like virus somewhere in Southeast Asia. I haven't been watching the news for that. Saudi Arabia? Was it Saudi Arabia? I think so, okay. yeah. But, Somewhere. Um, yeah, that's really, right? <laughs> and the other part of the world, mm -hmm. I know that they just came up with something. So anyways, for all of these reasons, most of the newly emerging infectious diseases are, RNA vir are, are um, diseases caused by RNA viruses. Okay, so this remembers to send our virus. So just for everybody, um, and here is the genome. It's single-stranded. It's RNA. And complex with that RNA are three proteins. One of those is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That's the L protein. It's called the L protein because it's the largest protein. OK. Um, we also have the phosphoprotein that participates with the L protein um, in transcription and in replication of the genome. And then Coding the whole RNA is uh, the nucleoprotein. And that also participates in um, the replication of the genome and in uh, transcription to make the messenger RNAs. Okay? So this comes in all complexed together like this. 
So these are the proteins that come in with the virus. Um, in addition to that, this right here, the blue, is the lipid bilayer. That's the piece of plasma membrane that was picked up by the virus as it exited the host cell. And found along the inner surface of that um, envelope is the matrix protein. Okay, and the matrix protein um, has a lot of roles it plays in the replication cycle of the virus. But one of those is to serve as a bridge between the viral proteins, the envelope proteins, and um, the ribonuclear protein complex. So this whole complex of RNA plus the three proteins are called the RNP or the ribonuclear protein complex. So, you know, I said that if you have a positive sense RNA virus, if you just get the RNA in, that RNA can, um, it's considered to be infectious. Well, this is infectious for positive or negative sense RNA viruses. If you get the RNP in, which contains all of the enzymes needed for replicating the genome and making messenger RNAs along with the genome, then you can have something that's infectious. And so, in addition, obviously, we have these two proteins that are embedded in the membrane, are the envelope of the virus, and those are um, the hemagglutinin neuraminidase, which are these proteins right here. Um, <clears throat> the hemagglutinin neuraminidase has two functions. One, it functions in attachment to the host cell via sialic acid residues, just like influenza does. Okay. Um, it also has a neuraminidase function. Nerminidase is an enzyme that cleaves sialic acid residues. So um, the nerminidase is usually not functional until the virus is getting ready to exit the host cell. And the idea behind that is that the virus, if it doesn't cleave off sialic acid residues, um, not only on viral proteins, but also on the surface of the cell it's exiting, it'll never get away from that cell. It'll just get stuck there. So this actually allows the virus to exit the host cell and then move out and potentially infect another host cell. Okay. Um, and then we've got the fusion protein, which most of you are pretty familiar with. That's the protein that um, is involved in fusing the envelope of the virus with the host cell membrane during the entry process. How many questions asked? So this is just a very um, quick discussion of how this virus replicates, because you actually kind of need to know this in order to understand reverse genetics. So um, here's the virus with um, the viral proteins associated with the viral RNA, and remember the HN is the protein that attaches to a host cell receptor. Once again, that host cell receptor contains sialic acid. Okay, so after the attachment of the HN to on the sialic acid, there are conformational changes that occur in HN. And somehow, it's not entirely clear exactly how this occurs, but somehow there's some sort of interaction between um, the HN and the F, and the conformational changes that occur in the HN are transmitted to F, and F undergoes some sort of conformational change. And what that does is it allows um, the fusion peptide of F to mediate a fusion event with the host cell plasma membrane. So um, I guess I'll get to that in a little bit about cleavage and everything. Okay. So um, once fusion occurs, this is after fusion has occurred, you can see that um, you leave behind on the plasma membrane the envelope of the virus. And what really gets released into the host cell is the RNP, which is the viral RNA with the associated proteins needed for uh, transcription and replication. Okay. So <clears throat> this um, is the RNP. Uncoding is a process that simply is, is used to, um, to de describe changes that need to occur in the RNA to make it ready to be used for either transcription or replication. So there's some sort of something that goes on, rearrangements of proteins or something, that 
allows then um, this RNP to be fully functional, okay, so that it can be involved in transcription to make all the messenger RNAs, okay. Um, so this virus makes monocystronic messenger RNAs. You know what that means? What does that mean? I forgot. What does polycystronic mean? So it, what it means basically is that mRNA encodes one protein. Huh. So a lot of viruses will um, transcribe this huge kind of messenger RNA and then make a huge public protein that gets cleaved up, or they make something that has internal ribosome entry sites so that the ribosomes can come in and start translation off, their, off of different areas within this long. Um, messenger RNA. This virus actually makes monocystronic messenger RNAs. So if you look at the genome of the virus, um, <coughs> between each gene, we have what's called an intergenic region. And this intergenic region has a, um, a start and a stop site. Okay. I understand I've been doing that all morning long. <laughs> so you start the transcription to make messenger RNA and it hits this stop site. Okay? And it stops and it stutters and it adds a poly A tail. Okay? And then the messenger RNA falls away. At this point, one or two things can happen. Um, either the polymerase falls off and goes back to the start and starts again, or it reinitiates because there's a, an initiation site here. Okay. So um, it reinitiates, I think, two thirds of the time. <coughs> And falls off and reinitiates at the beginning a third of the time. And so that happens every time um, it hits one of these intergenic regions. If it continues on, you know, hit the next intergenic region, the same thing happens. So if you look at the amount of protein that's produced for, for each of the genes, there's a gradient of decreased amounts of protein produced from those that are found at this end to those that are found at this end. Okay. So the last protein is L protein. It's a an enzyme. You don't need a lot of it because it you know keeps going and going and going, right? So, anyways, that's a little bit about how it it um, makes monocystronic messenger RNAs. So it makes these messenger RNAs, okay? And the L and the NP and the P and the M are all translated in the cytoplasm, okay? Um, but the um, HN and the F are translated on membrane-bound ribosomes. Okay. And so um, during translation, they get translocated into the ER, and they get glycosylated. Okay. And so everybody knows how things move from the ER to Golgi to plasma membrane, right? It's, it's a, um, in membrane vesicles. So from the ER, a membrane vesicle will pinch off with the protein in it and infuse with the Golgi apparatus. And then the same kind of thing happens um, as it moves to the plasma membrane. Okay? And during the process of movement from the ER to the Golgi, there's trimming and changes in the glycosylation um, in the ER. The carbohydrates are all added as a huge bulk addition, and then there's modifications as it moves through uh, the Golgi. And ultimately, it comes out of the Golgi, um, once again, in vesicles, and moves to the plasma membrane, and the vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane. And you've got these proteins, these viral proteins, that are then um, moved into the plasma membrane of the post-cell. So that's what these are right here. And, and actually, when these, um, when you get this 
fusion event occurring, you get the viral proteins placed in the plasma membrane, they actually push aside host cell proteins. So you end up with patches, really, of areas on the plasma membrane of the host cell where you've got mainly viral proteins. And so, presumably what's happening is that um, this is going on at the same time you've got um, replication of the genome starting, okay? So you've got a negative sense, then you get a full length positive sense genome, okay? So the same enzymes are involved in messenger RNA synthesis and replication of the genome, but the mechanisms are not entirely identical because you can separate them by making mutations that won't affect one or the other of those mechanisms, okay? So, once again, you get some antigenomic RNA, okay? So that's a term that's used, antigenomic, which means it's the opposite sense of genomic RNA. That, these proteins, which are the proteins that are involved in replication and transcription, will actually complex with that full-length positive sense RNA. Um, and then you will get from that a full-length negative sense RNA, which is genomic RNA, and more of these proteins will complex for that, okay? Um, the M protein, once again, is made in the cytoplasm, and it's not really clear entirely if it has its own transport signals. There's some indication that it does, others maybe not, um, so that it gets moved to the plasma membrane of the host cell, and presumably where you've got um, viral proteins.